Good evening, good evening, Holman Street and all of our streamers. Welcome to our Tuesday night Bible study. Before we get started, I want to encourage everyone to be safe. You know, we've got weather and COVID, but do everything you can to keep safe. Obey the uh, criteria that the mayor and other people have put out. Let's keep ourselves safe. Uh, during this particular time. We're praying for you and you continue to pray for us. Now tonight we want to welcome again Pastor Matthew Davis of the New Beginning Church who is a son in the ministry here began preaching 28 years ago and has been pastor at New Beginning for 16 years. Help me welcome Pastor Matthew Davis. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another privilege, another honor, another opportunity to come before your word. We thank you, Father God, that you blessed us to study your word, that your word has become real to us. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us and saturate in your word. Bless us, Father God, that old habits will be thrown away, old burdens will be rolled away, that we will be better at 8 o'clock than we were at 7 o'clock that lives will roll on a little bit longer and that we will run and tell men, women, boys, and girls about this Jesus we serve. So in Jesus' name we pray, amen, and thank God. I say thank you again to the Homo Street Church for another privilege to stand uh, before you and to declare this word of God. I believe it is God's word that makes us whole and makes us who we are, amen? So thank you again for this opportunity. Let me call your attention to Matthew in the New Testament. Again, we will drop by chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 through 20. <coughs> Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 through 20. When you found it, you will discover these words. And I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Thank you so much. Tonight I want to talk about the profession of the church. The profession of the church. The profession of the church. Well, last week we talked about the decoration of the church and I said unto you that in the 21st century we are confused on what the decoration we ought to proclaim of Jesus Christ. The church has left its home base. The church is at a crossroad. We have hurricanes, we have, we have pandemics, we have racism, we have another episode of police brutality. The church is at the crossroad in the fact the church must decide where she must stand. The gospel is needed like never before. Jesus is becoming less recognized and he is being bombarded by other religions just as it was in the day that Matthew penned these words. There are many religions, really many religious groups and many false doctrines that are still cropping up all around us on every hand. The question today is, what is going to be the declaration and the proclamation of the church? Where will the church proclaim? What will the church say? How will the church react? Jesus asked his disciples, whom do men say that the Son of Man am? Then he asks, who do you say that I am? I said to you on last meeting that 
we are oftentimes looking at the public's opinion and the public is looking at us, the church, and trying to figure out where the church really stands. I said to you that the church must take some position. They must take a stable position, and that position of the church ought to be one that Jesus is the person of the Christ. There is nothing or nobody that can get us from planet Earth to heaven other than Christ. And tonight I want to let you know that there is nothing or nobody, no one who can give us power, power to the church other than Jesus Christ. We must consecrate on our profession of Christ and declare that Jesus the Christ is the Messiah. He is the conquering king of Calvary himself. Jesus the Christ is our savior and he must become our Lord. I said to you on last meeting that this word Christ means Messiah, the anointed one, the consecrated one of God that is consecrated for the service of all mankind. This God that we talk about, he is the supreme one, the divine de deity, he is the divinity himself. He is the extreme, exceeding, God, there's no one like our God. Jesus asked these two questions in this same pericope. He asked, who do men say that I am? And some say that you are Elijah. Some say you are John the Baptist that have come back from the dead. Some say that you're Jeremiah. And then some say that you one of the other prophets. I want to let you know today that he's not just a prophet. He is the Christ. He is not just another man of the Old Testament. He is Jesus the Christ. He is not just a prophet that has prophesied of his coming in the past. He is the present day Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah himself. Peter spoke up like he always has spoken. And Peter says, I know who you are. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I said to you on last week that you need to understand that the church ought to be proclaiming the same thing, the decoration that Peter gave, the same right decoration that Peter gave ought to be the decoration that the church, and even in the 21st century, is now giving. Jesus says to Peter that flesh and blood didn't reveal this unto you, but my Father, God who is in heaven, has revealed this unto you. Nature didn't reveal it. Human nature didn't reveal it. Your carnality didn't reveal it. And you in the physical as a moral man did not come up with this. It's not in our dreams that we, we found this. But Peter had to hear from Jesus. And Jesus said to Peter, but my Father, God in heaven, has revealed this unto you word reveal means to take the cover off, to, to expose, to disclose. This, this word uh, reveal means that it's a supernatural occurrence that has taken place. So Jesus says to Peter that God, my Father in heaven, has revealed this unto you. And I want to say to the church today that if we're going to have any divine revelation, it has to come from our Father, which is in heaven. And if you're going to have a re divine revelation this day, you got to find it in the book. <laughs> I heard a lady speaking one day on Massey Radio, and she said that God will tell you to do some things one day that's not in the book. <laughs> God will tell you to do some things that has never been done before. I'm so glad that my button had an off switch to it and I just switched it off because I understood real well that if God is going to speak, he's going to speak through his book and through his son. The Hebrew writer says that, that God in past time, God at sundry's time, God in times past spoke through the prophets, but today he's speaking by way of his son. You know his son, don't you? His name is Jesus. 
So that's what we pick up today. We're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 16, and, and we're looking at verses 18 through 20, where Jesus has already told Peter that flesh and blood didn't reveal this unto you. My Father in heaven has revealed it unto you. And he picks up in verse number 18 and says, I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the very gates of hell should not prevail against it. You got to make sure, you got to make sure that you don't get it twisted and think that Jesus is building his church on Peter the rock. Yes, yes, this word Peter, this word Peter is, is, is Petros. It, it means, it means uh, uh, the stone, it means a rock. And yes, Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church. But he's really talking about the profession that Peter made. I told you last week that when we get baptized, we go in the water. The, the baptizers will say, by the profession of your faith or by the confession of your faith, I do baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want to let you know the church ought to have a profession. The church ought to have a profession of faith that regardless of what goes on, regardless of who's in the White House, the church ought to stick to her profession of faith. So Peter gives this profession, and he says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He says it right. Peter has spoken up sometimes past, and he got it wrong. <laughs> But now Peter speaks up, and Peter declares that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Jesus says to Peter, Peter, you are Petros. You are the rock. But now you have to understand that he won't declare that Peter is the rock simply because no man is the rock. No man, no man is the profession of faith. No man can really stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jesus. So he's not declaring that Peter is the rock, but he is declaring that Peter's profession of faith, the profession of the church, is the rock. Because if you're going to have a rock, you better run to Jesus. If you're going to have a rock, you need to trust in God. God is our rock. God is our perfect work. God is our fortress. God is the head of the church. I said to you last time, and I say again, that no man is the head of the church other than Christ. Any man that proclaims that he's the head of the church, just ask him when did he die for the church? When was he buried for the church? And when did he resurrect for the church? So Jesus is the rock, the profession of faith that Peter talks about. God's church is built upon the rock of Christ and not of Peter. Well, you, you know, it makes common sense that it's not built upon Peter. You know that, don't you? The reason why we know it makes sense that to not be built on Peter because we're talking about a natural man that, that was not born of a woman and instituted by God. He was born of a man and a woman. Jesus the Christ was born of a woman, a virgin called Mary, but God was his father. Now, when we look at Peter, Peter had a biological mama and a biological daddy. And so we know that Peter is not the rock. He's not the rock by which the church is built upon because if the church was built on the rock of a natural man, the church will come crumbling and falling down. The next reason why we know that he's not talking about Peter is because we're talking about the same Peter that's a lying Peter. We, we're talking about the same Peter that's a violent Peter. We're talking about Peter that took the knife and cut off Malchus's neck when he came to arrest Jesus. We're talking about a prejudiced Peter, a Peter that Paul had to stand face to face with. And when he was looking at the Gentiles and spending time with the Gentiles, and he was friend with the Gentiles, but when the, the Jews showed up, he acted like he didn't know the Gentiles. Paul, the Bible says that Paul had to stand him to his face and call him back from his prejudiceness. So we can't have the church built on a prejudiced Peter. And no, we can't have the church built on a cussing Peter. 
the Bible says when Jesus was arrested and, and the little girl said, that's the one, he's the one, not only did Peter deny Christ, he also went to cussing. None of you deacons go to cussing when you get upset, do you? I'm talking about Peter. Peter, I'm not talking about you. Peter is a cussing Peter, so we can't build a church on Peter. And then Peter is, is a mistaken Peter. He's a misspeaking Peter. Peter is the one that makes mistakes, so the church cannot be built on Peter. The good thing about Peter, though, the good thing about Peter, he's, even when he messed up, he knew how to get back to the Lord. <laughs> let, me, let me just share with you, brother, you're going to mess up. <laughs> The, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, and verse 9 says, If a man says he has not sinned, verse 8, a man says he has not sinned, he's telling a lie. And then it says in verse number 9, If you sin, then you have an advocate in Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, this word if in the original transfer, translation means that when you sin and because you're going to sin. And let me tell you, brother, it doesn't matter if you're a deacon, doesn't matter if you're in, in the choir doesn't matter if you're an usher doesn't matter if you're an sa you're gonna mess up and you're gonna sin and so john says in first john 1 and 9 he says and when you sin we have an advocate in jesus the christ and jesus the christ will bring us back not only did he bring us back he bought us back with his precious blood on calvary the good thing about Peter, the good thing about Peter is when he came back to the Lord, that same lying Peter, that same cussing Peter, that same prejudiced Peter, that same misspeaking Peter, that same violent Peter stood up and preached Jesus and him crucified and over 3,000 souls came to Christ. Let me just share with you, if you find yourself in a bad situation, and you just don't know how to get out of it. I'm going to tell you, I've been there. You don't mind if I testify, do you? I've been there. I've found myself in some bad situation. And when I got myself in, and let me just tell you this, nobody coerced me to get there. It wasn't pure pressure that got me there. I found myself in a messed up situation, and I delivered, and the devil didn't make me do it either. <laughs> I deliberately, willingly, recklessly got there on my own. I found myself messed up, and I had to find by myself back to Jesus. <laughs> now, Muhammad couldn't get me there. Buddha couldn't get me there. Confucius couldn't get me there. Aristotle couldn't get, the, get me there. Uh, it, it, no one could get me there but Jesus. So Peter stood and he preached the word of God. I'm so glad that we got, we got a God who, re, who redeems us. I'm so glad that we got a God that, that allows us to get shaken up and he, he receives us back to him. The Bible teaches that God is in love with the backslider. And so if you have slid back, God is in love with you. The Bible says that he's standing with open arms in Luke chapter 15. There's a boy. And this boy that's in Luke chapter 15 went to his daddy, the younger of the two sons, went to his daddy and said, give me all that lies unto me. And what what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave this place. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been there when you found yourself, I'm sick and tired of this place. Some of you have left Holman Street and said, I'm going to go find me a church where they bumping and they jumping up. I'm going to find me a church where they really waving their hands. And some brothers said, I'm going to find me a church where the sister just shows up. And when they show up, they got half of the clothes on and they left the other half at the house. And don't you know God forgives us and God keeps us? He wraps his arm around us. And I thank God that he, he is waiting as that boy daddy did when he was waiting on him to return. The Bible said the boy in Luke chapter 15, he, get, he did all he could do and messed up his daddy's stuff and came back home. The Bible says that he saw him, he ran to him, he had compassion on him, he fell upon his neck and he wrapped his arm around him. I'm so glad that God... God will take me in. You may not take me in, but God has taken me in, and he's given me another chance. Hallelujah. That's what Jesus did for Peter. Jesus gave Peter another chance, and Peter stood, and he proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. He proclaimed it clearly. He could proclaimed it without whooping. He proclaimed it without shouting. He stood flat-footed and said, the same Christ that you crucified, 
that Christ that you crucified, he got up early that third day morning. He rose from the dead. And the Bible says that he didn't preach ebony nor jet. He did not preach the internet. He just preached Jesus. The church has to get to a point in our lives where we just teach and preach and live Jesus. When we preach, teach, and live Jesus, then Jesus is glorified, and Jesus is able to keep us and wrap his arm around us. God can still use us. Even when you mess up, God can still use you. God, God is still standing on the Gary. I missed somebody right there. God is still standing on the Gary, standing on the porch, looking for you to come on back in. My God, my, my little brother, my little sister, if you messed up, God is still waiting on you. He is still urging you. And that, that thing that you feel deep down in your heart, it is, it is not heartburn. It is the Spirit of God trying to draw you back to Jesus. We ought, to, we, ought to, we ought to minister to people. We ought to tell them about Christ. We ought to lead people to Christ. But no one can come to God unless the Spirit of God leads them. We have to make ourselves available for the Spirit of God. I want to bring out five points, and I'll leave you alone. My first point is presence. 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 The church is needed to be present. I'm telling you that, that we need a church present. We need a church that is blood bought by Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, Holman Street, if you're going to be a church and not a social club, you got to be present in this mean and dark world. It, it, always, it, always, it always trips me out. It blows my mind how these great evangelistic men, these great evangelistic potentates, these great men of God and their in evangelical opportunities will stand and they will say, I cannot support abortion, but they will support black and brown men being killed every day. It, it, it bothers me. It, it, it fa I can't fathom it. I can't see it. How, how you can say that you cannot, and I know we ought not kill unborn children, but we ought not kill grown men and women and boys and girls either. Let me tell you, if the church is going to be the church, the church has to have a place to stand and say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired of being sick and tired, and I can't put up with it anymore. It, it's just as bad to be quiet. It's just a bad to hold your peace. Our, our brethren, our evangelical brethren are just holding their peace. They, they're just watching things happen, and, and they don't want to be on any side or the other. Let me tell you, you can't straddle the fence with God. You have to get to a point where you have a proclamation, you have a profession of the church, and say, be willing to say that the church is what I stand in and Christ is who I stand on. We, we remember, we remember the, the series from the book of Acts in the 80s and the 90s, don't we? Here at the Holman Street Church, as we walk through the series in the late 80s and the early 90s, we walk through the series on the book of Acts. And Pastor MBJ would say it like this, the church at her birth was the church at her best. I remember, and I'm an old man, I remember those days when he would say the church at her birth was the church at her best. And so if we're going to be a church that is powerful and strong in the move of God, if we're going to be a church that loves the Lord, we have to pattern ourselves after the first century church. So the church has to be present. The, the world needs the church to be present. The world needs the church to be on their job. My next point is the church has to stick to her purpose. <laughs> the church, the church, the church has a presence and the church also has a purpose. The purpose of the church is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, it's good that we feed folk it's good that we, we minister to people. It's good that we mission to people. But let me tell you, when we mission, whether we are playing baseball, softball, whether we're running track or wasting, you ought to find a place to sneak in to get in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the church's purpose is to minister to people by presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the good thing about this gospel of Jesus Christ, when the church is present, 
and the church remember his purpose, then the church is powerful. Let me tell you, the church is powerful. The church is powerful. It's right there in the text. In verse number 18, it says, Upon this rock, I will build my church. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Upon this rock, I will build my church. The word build means to construct. The word build means to, to embolden. The word build means to edify. It comes from the Greek word akademi. And this word economy means to give structure to. You see, when Jesus was talking to Peter and his disciples, he was telling them, upon this rock, I will construct my church. It is the idea of an architect painting and laying out the lines as to how a church should be constructed. I, I want to tell you, Homer Street, you have an opportunity to do it right. You have an opportunity to lay it out right. I told you earlier that you can't depend on Peter being the lead. You can't depend on building the church on Peter simply because any man in which you build a church on is a fleeing church, is fleeing the moment, and it's a failing church. We must build on the rock. The rock is Jesus. This word, this word akademi, this word bill, means to edify with boldness. It means a job that is done by the architect. And whatever the architect design is how the builder has to keep it in line. Let me just share with you, the architect has already designed the church. And as you study the book of Acts, you will see how the architect has already designed the church. You don't have to go create another plan. You, you don't have to go and look up how, how the five steps to creating a church. You don't, you don't have to go and look at the 12 steps to, to making sure that you have church. This word church is the Greek word ekasia. It is the called out. It is the assembly of God. It is the Christian community. It is the membership of the church. And let me tell you, people don't join the church. <laughs> people don't join the church. They are born into the church. <laughs> The, the reason why, not at this church, but at other churches, the reason why they have so much hell in the leadership is because, I'm talking about the church down the street, around the corner now, is because they have too many people that are in leadership that are not born again. They are not saved. And you can tell when one has been born again. When you're born again, your life is changed. When you're born again, you are set free. When you are born again, you act like you're born again. Oh, yeah, you mess up. Oh, yeah, you fall short. Even your desires get in trouble. And let me just share with you, Homer Street, if your personal desires don't get in the way, God can bless you. If your personality doesn't get in the way, God can bless you. If, if you don't get in the way, let me tell you, I have to get out of my way sometimes. <laughs> I, I have to move over sometimes. If God is doing a new thing, if God is doing a new work, let me just share with you, God is not doing anything newer than what he's already done. The, the, the book has been written. The book has been taken place. The book has been sealed, signed, and delivered. There was a song when I was growing up, signed, sealed, and delivered. And then he would say, I'm yours. You, you understand where I'm coming from. God is saying to us that he has already sealed everything we need right here in the book. We don't have to go looking for it. It's in the book. The one good thing that really blessed me, one thing that really, really blessed me when I became the new pastor of the New Beginning Church, never done this before, didn't really want to do it. It was just thrust in my lap, but I knew I was, the, I was the seventh preacher in 12 years. You get a hold on that? I was the seventh preacher in 12 years, and, and I knew that they were ushering them out as they come through the front door. They put them out the back door. But the one thing that blessed me is that any time a confusion came up, I would say, let's go to the book. <laughs> let's see what the book says about it. And when it's in the book, we have to follow the book. So, brothers, if you ever get crossways with anybody, well, just let's look at the book. <laughs> the problem with the average church, they don't know the book. They think that because you are a CEO or CFO, COO on your job, you can be the CEO of the church. Let me tell you, you got to follow the book. <laughs> Every organized organization is given a manual, and this is our manual. And not only are we an organization because we have to have organization, we are an organism. 
That's what the church is. It's a living, breathing organism. And that's why we get excited because we get, we get involved with this living and breathing organism. So this, this word church, this word church is not the brick and mortar that we see. And, and yes, we ought to go to church. The Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 10 that we ought not forsake the assembly of ourselves as some people do, so we ought to come to church. Brothers, thank y'all so much. Sisters, thank you so much for coming to church tonight. <laughs> we, ought to come, we ought to come to the place that is called church. We ought to assemble together at the place called church. That's one form of church. And then the second form is the born-again believers. That's what he's talking about. He's building his church on the fact that the congregation has come together and we are the church and let me tell you there's a third form of church too when you come to church and you find yourself at the church and you get with the body of Christ who is the church you ought to sure enough have some church <laughs> you, you ought to have some church you ought, you ought to have some church I would not get up early in the morning make my way down here to the 715 service and just sit like a bump on a log and never have any church I wouldn't drive my car and listen to Christian radio and not really have some church. We ought to ride down the road and have some church. Just the other day, a brother was riding down the road, tears streaming down his eye. I looked over there at him. He said, nothing wrong, brother. I'm just thinking about the goodness of the Lord. You ought to have some church. In the shower, you ought to have church. So the Bible says, the Bible says that upon this rock I will build my church, and the very gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He says the gates of hell. Now, if we have a church, God has a way of blessing the church. So we have the presence of the church. We have the purpose of the church. And now we have the power of the church. Yeah, it's, it's the power of the church and the fact that the gates of hell should not prevail against the church. The very gates of hell. The word gates is the leaf. The word gates is the swinging, folding interest, the, a way of going in and out the church. And let me tell you, the gates of hell is swinging all around us. <laughs> and even, even sometime in the church, you know, even in the church, the gates of hell is swinging. And you know, it, the, the problem with the gates of hell swinging is because some of us get shy and embarrassed and we can't use the power that God has given us. And the power is the word of God. When Jesus was bombarded in Matthew chapter 3 and Matthew chapter 4 by the devil when you know you read it every first Sunday and, and he was bombarded by the devil after he was in 40 days and 40 nights hungry the Bible says the devil came up to him and said look I tell you what you're hungry now I tell you what to do turn these stones into bread Jesus said oh no he spoke the word from duty running and he said to him man shall not live by bread alone but every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God then he takes him up, according to Luke chapter 4, he takes him up unto an exceeding high mountain, shows him the wonders of the world, and said, I will give all these things unto you if you just bow down unto me. The Bible says that he told the devil to get thee behind me. And then in Matthew and Luke, they turn it, the last two backwards and forward, and they separate the two. But then the devil says unto him, I tell you what, if you won't worship me, if you won't do 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 the fact of giving yourselves to making these stones bread I tell you what go on and jump you see the devil saw that Jesus was quoting the scripture and so the devil began to quote the scripture <laughs> the devil said and he quoted one of your favorite scriptures he looked over there in Psalm 91 and when he looked in Psalm 91 he said go on and jump Go on and take a leap. Go on and jump because the, the Lord your God will give his angels charge over you. Let me tell you, somebody in this room, I want to let you know, and someone listening to us, I want to let you know that the devil is trying to take your very life. The devil wants you to go on and jump, do something crazy, do something out, outrageous so he can take you out of here. But don't do that because another thing that the devil was trying to do to Jesus when he was in the wilderness, what he was really trying to do to Jesus is short circuit Calvary. He said to Jesus, go on and jump. He will give your angels charge over you, but God already had it worked out. He was on his way to Calvary. You see, if Jesus had jumped and killed himself, then he would 
wouldn't have made it to Calvary. Jesus wanted him, to, God wanted Jesus to go to Calvary because that's why you're here tonight because he went to Calvary. You're here tonight because he walked up to Calvary. You're here tonight because he died on an old rugged cross on Calvary. So the devil will try to make you kill yourself. He will try to make you do yourself some harm. So there's the presence of the church. There's the purpose of the church. There's the power of the church. And then there's the protection of the church. Look at what he says. He says, the gates of hell should not prevail against it. The gates of hell. This, this word hell is the unseen. This word hell is Hades. This word hell is a place or a state of departure of the souls. And this word hell is even the grave. Let me just share with you, the gates of hell should not prevail against you. And you see, when, when, we, have, when we have the protection of God, when we are saved, we are saved from three things. Let, are you with me? We are saved from three things. First of all, we have salvation. And, and back home, they would call it justification. And they would say it's just as if you had not sinned. What they're saying is that you're on your way to heaven even though you don't deserve it. And when you have justification, God no longer sees your sin, but he sees the blood of Jesus. So he saves us from the penalty of sin. The second thing he saves us from, he saves, he saves us from, from sin itself. Not only does he save us from the penalty of sin, he saves us from the power of sin. And there we have sanctification. Let me tell you, when you're saved, you're saved just one time. You don't have to get in another prayer line. You don't have to bow down anymore. You don't have to invite Christ into your, your life anymore. You are saved just one time. So salvation is an event. But sanctification is a continual process. And when you are sanctified, you are holy and you reside in holy living. When you're sanctified, you have right living. When you're sanctified, you're able to walk through peer pressure and still stand for the Lord. God is protecting us because he saved us from the penalty of sin. Now he's saving us from the power of sin that sin has no dominion, no control, no authority over us. And one of these days, he's going to protect us even more. One of these days, he's going to save us from the presence of sin. That is glorification. We will have glorification. We will have glorified, Holy Ghost-filled bodies. We, we will have the presence of God every day. That's why the old saints back home would say, every day going to be Sunday. <laughs> there will be no more goodbye. <laughs> the, and as we walk around heaven... <laughs> all day we're gonna have that we're gonna go to a place of no more no more shouting no more crying no more pain no more agony no more corruption we're going to a place of no more now people ask the question all the time how how is it that when Lazarus was had and Lazarus had these sores on him Lazarus had these sores throughout his body he had even a a finger that was was, had pus coming out of it. He had sores all around him. But when Lazarus died, he died, he found himself in Abraham's bosom, the rich man that wouldn't give him the crumbs off his table. He said, well, why don't you let Lazarus dip his finger? <laughs> now, was he talking about his sore finger? Was he talking about his pustrous finger? Why don't you let Lazarus dip his finger in a cup of water and just put it on my tongue down here in hell? The reason why he, he wanted him to, to take his finger and put it in water, put it on his tongue because Lazarus' finger was no longer corrupt. Le Lazarus' finger was no more pustulous. Lazarus had a glorified finger. And that's what God is going to do for us one day. We're going to be glorified. We're going to have glorified body. God has protected us. And my final point, and I'll leave you alone, we have privileges. <laughs> we, we have privileges. We have, we have privileges. Now, I want to tell you, we have privileges. We have we have privileges. It says the very gates of hell would not come against us, would not prevail, would not prevail against us. It didn't say that, that hell wouldn't show up. It says that hell won't have any power. <laughs> it won't prevail against us. This, this word prevail means to, to overpower. This word prevail is to overpower and come against us in such a way until it tears us down. Let me tell you, church may fold, but the church itself must move on. Let me tell you, the church as Jesus has planted, the church on which Jesus has built this profession of faith, 
this church will go when no other church lives. He says that, he says that we, have, we have privileges. We, we have privileges. And you know what he says about in verse number 19, Matthew chapter 16, verse number 19, he gives us our privileges. He, he gives us our privileges. He, he gives us our privileges. He gives us our privileges. He says in verse 19, Matthew chapter 16, he says, And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He, he said he's going to give you some keys. Let me tell you, the person with the keys have the authority. <laughs> the, the person with the keys have the power. Have you ever seen people sitting down? You know, sometimes children can get sassy with their parents. And, and when they get sassy with their parents, they sometimes walk away. But they forgot that the parents have the keys. <laughs> you, can, you can walk away all you want to. You can leave and come in when you get ready. But the parents have the keys. And, and because I have the keys, I have the power. I have the, the devices for which it's used to open and close the door. The Bible is telling us today in Matthew 16 that Jesus has given Peter the keys. He has given him the power, given him the authority, and given him responsibility. The problem with a lot of us, we have keys, and we don't really realize the privilege that we have. We don't understand the power that we have. We don't understand the authority that we have, and we sure don't want any responsibility. And it doesn't matter if you're in the black house or the white house. You ought to take on some responsibility. Are you with me? So we have some keys. We have keys. And with the keys come responsibility. With the keys come power. You ought to make sure that you remind God every chance you get, God, you gave me some keys. And let me use the keys. He says, not only do I give you keys, I give you a special type of keys. These are the keys to the kingdom. This word kingdom is royalty. This word kingdom is the ruleship. The word kingdom is the realm. And you do know that the war is not going on down here on planet Earth, don't you? The war is going on in heavenly places in the high epsilon realm. The war is going on in the foundations of power. The sovereign God himself is the one who's at war with the devil. And let me tell you, the devil may be powerful. But the devil is not all powerful. We serve a God that has given us some keys, and that God is all powerful. If, 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 you, if I was in, in, in a lecture, I would tell them not only is he powerful, he's omnipotent meaning that he has all the power that one will ever have. Not only is he all-powerful, he is omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere at the same time. Everywhere he goes, he bumps into himself. He is omnipresent. Not only is he all-powerful, not only is he all-present, he is, he is also all-knowing. He's omniscient. That means that he knows everything. He sees everything even before we do it. And finally, this God that we serve, he is a sovereign God. And many times we wonder why things bad happen to us. Let me just share with you, Holman Street. God is a sovereign God. He does what he wants to do with whom he chooses to do it any time he chooses to do it because he's God. He doesn't have to ask for permission. He's God. He, he's just God. And because he is God, he has rulership. And we're talking about the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Heaven is the board of God. It is where God is. It, 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 God, God is sitting in heaven. It is the elevation. It is the elevated place. It is eternity, and it is the place of power. Don't you know that God was here before we got here? Don't you know that God, there is no beginning to God? There's no ending to God. He is God of eternity. He was in eternity past. He's in eternity present. And he's in eternity future. He, he got there before, got there, got there. He's God. He is God. So he is, we have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And the privilege is we have the ability to bind and loose. Now, this passage has been messed up so poorly and so greatly <laughs> where people walk around you know in, in some of the churches where they, they deem themselves in great authority and they believe that no one has that authority that they have it, it kind of goes like this on the radio he will, the apostle will be here and he will be walking the floor like never before 
he will be healing. Now, let me tell you, if there's some healing going on, it's coming from the healer himself. It's coming from Jehovah, God, Jehovah Rophi himself. God himself is the only one that does heal. And every time I hear, every time I hear, you know, I kind of think like that sometimes. Every time I hear a brother that's saying he's, he's going around, he's going from Colosseum to Colosseum healing and, and send me, I send you my nasty stinking rag and, and you're going to be blessed and highly favored and, and you're going to be blessed with a rhema word. I told you last week that a rhema word is a new word and there's no other word other than God's word. So there are no new words. So he says, I'm going to send you this handkerchief. And I told the folk at the New Beginning Church, if I give you my handkerchief that I just got through using, you're going to get some snot, some tears, and you're going to get some sweat, and you can go home and wash it or throw it away. It doesn't matter. We cannot think that we have more authority than the great I am himself. If God chooses to use us, it's a privilege. If God chooses to bless us, he has given us a privilege that he has given so many. Too often men try to paint the picture that they are the only one that's doing these great things. He says that I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And you, whatever you bind, I will bound. Whatever you loose, I will loose. And I see people all the time, I devil, I bind you in the name of Jesus. You have to look at the text and let the text speak to you. The text has continuity. In the text, Jesus is setting up his church. In the text, Jesus is putting together structure. What he's saying is what you need to do is understand that whatever structure you put in place, as long as it's agreement with what I've already told you in my word, then whatever you bind, I will bind. Whatever you loose, I will loose. And see, this word bind means to bond together, means to knit together, to tie together, to wove together. But this word bind also means to request and also to petition. What he's saying is you have to request of God before you do anything. <laughs> you have the petition of God before you take on any anything. You need to make sure that you are one who binds and loose according to God's standard. The word loose means to set free, means to, to break down, to di dis dissolve. It means to put off and to destroy. The, the church is a powerful organism. And that's why the church has to be something that no other organization is. We can't have scrimmages in the church. We can't have cliques in the church. I told, I told him, anytime you have a click in the church, you just got a sophisticated gang. <laughs> I'm, I got my gang. I, I got my gang, and I'm with my gang. And what people do is they get in clicks, and they think they have this supernatural power. And let me tell you, if you are supernatural, you're only super because God is super, and he puts some super on your natural. It ain't about you. It's, it's not about you because God has made us who we are and he has done what he has chosen to do for all of us verse number 20 he says <clears throat> then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ when you look at the text it looks like Jesus first of all when he talks about in the first part of this pericope he talks about what do men say that I am? And then what do you say that I am? It looks like Jesus is arrogant. It looks like Jesus want his ego stroked. It, it looks like Jesus want them to tell him, what do men say that I am? Then when you get to verse number 20, he says, don't tell a soul. Don't tell any man what I've said. You see, Jesus wants to be able to reveal himself unto us individually. He doesn't want us to get the grapevine. He, he doesn't want us to get it off Twitter and TikTok. He doesn't want us to get it off email. He want a personal relationship with us, and he want us to be revealed to him, and him revealed himself unto us. And that's why, that's why we have to watch what we do with, with our keys. You have to be careful, brethren. You have to be careful, sister, what you do with your keys. <laughs> 
You have to be careful what you do with your keys. One day, I saw a father give his son keys to go open the door, and then the son came back, and he didn't have his keys. He said, son, what you do with my keys? The boy may have been about eight years old. He said, son, what did you do with my keys? Well, I left them in there on, the, on your desk. He said, no, when, you, when I give you my keys, <laughs> you bring my keys back to me because my keys are too important to get lost. You see, because keys mean authority. What he did was he gave him the authority to open the door and the authority to close the door, and he's supposed to have brought back his keys. I just want to let you know that Jesus has donated us some keys. He, he died over 2,000 years ago. He gave us some keys, and when he gave us his keys, let me tell you, one of these days he's coming back to look for his keys. <laughs> He's coming back, and he want to know what have you done with, with his keys. Let me tell you, Jesus want to reveal himself to you, so much so until he wants to know from you, number one, have you been born again? Number two, what have you done since you've been saved? Number three, are you sanctified? Are you living a Holy Ghost-filled life, a life of the Lord Jesus Christ? That's why we shouldn't say the Bible says that we... We have, we are to work out our soul salvation because that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we ought to work out our salvation with fear and trembling because our soul is already fixed when we're saved. We ought to work out our salvation in such a way that the world will see. The world will see that we're born again. The, there's a waiting world out there. And they are waiting to see what the, the Holman Street Church is going to do at this junction in your life. The, the world is waiting to see how you're going to handle it. The world is waiting to see if you're going to lift up Jesus, that Jesus will draw all men unto himself. Whatever you do, stick with the profession of the church. And that profession is that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. And out of obedience unto God, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me. He died over 2,000 years ago on a tree. <laughs> he died over 2,000 years ago on a stick. He, he died over 2,000 years ago on a cross. He, he died. He voluntarily died over 2,000 years ago for his church. That's why, that's why the preacher, the pastor, is never, is never the head of the church. He can be the best man that's looking out for the bride until the, until the groom get back to rapture up his church. I, I want to tell you, Jesus the Christ died for his church. And if there's anybody listening to me today, and you've never received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, this is your moment. You can get to know him in Bible study. You can get to know Jesus in the departing of your sins. You ought to get to know Jesus. And it's a very simple thing. Just repeat after me as I lead you in this simple prayer. And the only thing I want to let you know is Jesus died for your sins. He buried in a borrowed tomb. He rose early that third day morning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5 say he died, he was buried, he rose, and he was seen by over 500 men at one time. If you're going to heaven, you're going to have to trust Jesus. And I know you say, but preacher, I've... I've done so much wrong. Let me just tell you, you haven't done anything worse than I have. And it's not what you have done that gets you to go to hell. It's not what you have done that gets you into heaven. It's what Jesus did for you over 2,000 years ago. He gave his life for you. And if you would, just bow your head right now and repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you prayed that prayer, you're born again, you're on your way to heaven. We believe if you trust the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, you're on your way to heaven. And when you die, you will open your eyes in heaven. There may be some people listening to me today that do not have a church home. I recommend the Holman Street Church. Go online to holmanstreet.org. 
join that church. Message them and let them know that you want to be a part of this great church in the middle of the city. Whatever you do, go on holmanstreet.org and, and ask for prayer. If you need prayer, we'll pray with you and pray for you. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. And if you want to give to the Holman Street Church, you can do that. You know, during this pandemic time, we need folk to give to the church. <laughs> the church is still on the move. Bills are still coming. And we need people to give to the church. So whatever you do, go to holmanstreet.org. Hit the, the give button and give to the Holman Street Church.